because the management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're in escrow. And you now can manage through the Home Advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's, it's all click of a button, guys. I read a stat recently that of the uh, the total number of buyers that are buying properties in today's world, roughly 27% of them are investors. And I don't know how accurate that data is, but I bet you the number still lies somewhere in that vicinity. And I thought that was an interesting stat that just ironically I read recently and and the guest our guest today uh, specializes specifically uh, on the topic of triple net. And we're talking triple net leases. We'll explain what that is if you're not familiar with it. But if you're in real estate and you don't know what the hell triple net is, man, you better tune in and pay attention because this is important for you. Our guest today is an OG from the Bigger Pockets podcast. Uh, he is a guest speaker, a consultant. He's written a book called Triple Net Riches and has a ton of knowledge and is, is an investor in that world. And he's going to explain all about triple net. But most importantly, I think for this real estate audience is understanding the opportunity that exists, not only for you as an individual and an investor, but for you to now maybe market better to investors, because that is a 25 plus percent segment of the market. And so there's a lot of opportunity here. And I promise our guest, Joel Owens, today is going to teach you something. So, Joe, welcome to the show, my friend. All right. Thanks a lot. Did you know, do you know anything about that stat, the stat that I just busted out at you that I heard on somewhere else? Do you Have you have you heard that at all? The 27 percent? or uh, Well, I mean, there's a lot of statistics out there. Um you could even, I, I would think the more important statistic for a broker or agent would be, um, since I do triple net, I'm more national in nature because I'm looking at big metrics, traffic counts, population, demographics. For most agents and brokers, they have more of a local flair. And so you really need to dive down into the, uh, you, you kind of have your macro data, which might be that 27%. And then you have your micro data, which is what is that particular market that you're working in day to day as an investor and as a broker agent? What are those statistics and what's happening there? Because you could have 27% nationally and then locally you could have 10% or you could have 40% locally. So knowing your micro market is, is more important than the macro. I love it. I love it. It's, it's a good point. So Joel, I, I mentioned a little bit about who you are and, and, you know, kind of your back, a little bit about your background, but uh, let's assume that our audience has never met or heard from you before. Tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of what led you down the path to get into this business and what you're now doing today. Yeah. So basically um, I own a couple of different businesses, uh, always entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial spirit. <laughs> tongue twister. Um, you know, my family has uh, some inventors in it. So my uncle Larry has passed away now. I'm a, a dad's brother. Uh, he invented goof off the, the hand cleaner. Um, and then they had oops and goo gone competitors come out later on. And um, then his son was one of the first people that do um, high language, uh, high language level computer linguistics back in the eighties and nineties. So our bloodline always wanted to do something different, you know, not just the standard uh, stuff. And so I owned a, you know, car audio business. Then I worked for um, Domino's Pizza for a while, the largest franchisee in the country, Calabunga Incorporated, the store manager there. And then I went out, opened my own restaurant. And uh, I just didn't like the hours, a lot of nights and weekends. And so then, so then I um, was driving uh, part-time for Domino's. And then a buddy of mine owned a landscaping business. And instead of hiring more crews, he was busting at the seams. He just decided to sell it off because he had an offer to buy his business. And then he went into residential 
well, I'd always been interested in real estate. And so then I got licensed and I found out quickly that residential nights and weekends wasn't for me. I was looking for something different. Um, but when I was driving, one of the older drivers there, his, him and his brother inherited a um, coin laundry shop uh, down in uh, Marietta, Georgia. And a developer approached them to buy their property because they wanted to assemble all these pieces and do a 650,000 square feet mixed use retail project there on about 20 acres. And so they called me in to review the contract. Um, I was just licensed for the first year. And the developer called me after the meeting and said, you caught every single out in our contract. No one's ever done that. You caught you know, all 12 outs we have in the contract to extend it or not put much earnest money down or you know, do all this bullshit stuff. And they're like, we've never had that happen before. And we're like, they brought me on board to assemble the other land pieces. And then I did that for about two years. Um, kind of, you know, a typical way is you go into a commercial real estate firm they stick you with a senior director that's been there forever and you get on a team and you cut your teeth that way. Mine was like fire and brimstone trial by fire, you know, balls out, just <laughs> learning on the street basically. And then after that happened, the uh, economy, you have these economic cycles that happen every 10, 12 years. And then it goes to where instead of new construction, people buy um, older buildings that are cheaper than what it would cost to build new at that point. And so then I went into selling large apartment buildings. Um, didn't really like that as much, uh, it was more as a residential aspect again. And then I just got into the uh, business side of it because I love business before because I owned other businesses and I just gravitated toward the triple net in the retail space. Wow. It's interesting that you, first of all, you said that you were in the business for roughly a year and you're the one digging through this contract with the fine, you know, with a fine comb, uh, you know, uh, that's, it's an interesting comment because you hear so often, especially from gray hair agents about maybe the younger generation of agents, how they just don't know how the hell to do their job. And, and let's be honest, we had an influx in our industry over, over, you know, the COVID years, uh, where every Tom, Dick and Harry just thought, well, I got time. I'm going to go ahead and get my license. You know, when it comes to just things like that, like reading through a contract and actually understanding and deciphering, um, you know, the the nuances and the specific details, what what would what would be your advice to a newer agent uh, who probably hasn't spent the time, or what is it that that kind of gave you, with limited experience, that eye to catch all of these outs? So I've been a lifelong learner. I learned to, I love to learn and read. And so what, I mean, everything's digital now on the internet, but back in the day, the internet was just starting out, you know, AOL dial up, all that crap. And so I would go to Barnes and Noble and I would go to the real estate section and I would pull like four books down. And then I would read all those books on the couch there or the chair in the span of two hours, because when you're starting out, you're poor, typically you don't have any money, but you got a lot of time when you get wealthy you have a lot of money, but you don't have time. It flips on you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you have a different problem uh, to deal with um, too much business, that kind of thing. Um, and so when you're, you have plenty of time in the beginning to read and learn, no one's going to give that to you. You have to go out there and, and learn yourself. And what I would do is I'd read the books real uh, through the whole book. And, uh, you know, some of them have fluff and stuff, but every once in a while, maybe one out of 10 books, they'd be so good. I'd be reading the pages slower, even though I'm a fast reader, because it had so much great info. And I would spend the only 15 bucks I have and I would buy that book, take it home and read it again, and again, and again, you know, and I would just, I read hundreds of books that way at Barnes and Noble. And then in the library, the library was free. I'd go find these, these older books that still had some good info in them. Maybe 60% of it was still relevant, but it was free. And I had, had all the time in the world. Right. Um, and so, you know, experience with deals will teach you so much. And then so much book knowledge will help you get started along the way. Um, I'd say the biggest thing is, um, don't bullshit people, you know, um, if you don't know an answer to something, say, that's a great question. Let me go find out the answer for you. Don't guess because some of the time you're not going to be right. You might get lucky and be right some of the time, but then the other times you're not right. Yeah. And then you lose all credibility in the space. So the best thing to do is just be honest with people and tell you, I'm, I'm not sure on that. Let me go research so I can get you the correct answer and get back with you. Yeah. 
I think a lot of people are afraid to say that I, my, my background's in the mortgage business and, you know, I'm a great relationship guy, but, but details never really stuck with me. That's why, that's why I needed underwriters. That's why I needed operational people. And uh, I, I went through that all the time and people would ask me a question that I should know, but I'd say, you know, man, they're, they're always changing the rules. The rules are changing every single day, every single week. Let me go double check with my underwriter. And uh, it never got me in trouble. And then you just go get the, you go get the answer. What I want to point out is for anybody young listening to this, did you hear what Joel just said? He had to go to bar, a bookstore. He didn't have the money. So he would take the books, read them while he was at the store, basically a library, essentially, uh, with, without being a library. That, that's grinding, folks. That's the, that's the kind of shit that you just, you're not willing to do, that you have to do. That's, I mean, I hate to say it, Joel, we're probably a similar age, but that what doesn't feel like it was that long ago. And now here we are today. And I can go to ChatGPT and ask any question, you know, uh, known to mankind and get an answer in a matter of seconds. And, you know, it was just a year or two ago that we had to rely on Google. That feels like that's antiquated times. Um, I love that story, man. I don't I don't know that that uh, any other podcast host will probably put that up on a pedestal like I will. But, man, that's that's a that's a really cool story and such a simple answer. And it's just you just put the time in, basically. Yeah, you have to, you, you can never, you can never um, quit. Like, you know, what I tell, a lot of people think I know a lot of stuff, which I do know a lot of stuff, but I've read thousands of books, tens of thousands of articles, but the way I view it every day. So there's, I call it kind of like two people in the world. Um, there's the people that are mediocre. I want to do just enough to function at a job and to earn an income. Well, those people are making maybe 40000 a year because they're not that great at, at what they do and they're lazy. They don't want to keep learning because the way they view it is, OK, I don't know anything. I start out in this career profession of real estate and I know maybe 70 percent of stuff. And now I'm going to stop because it's just enough for me to function and close a transaction and it, it exists like a blog, you know, um, and they're like, why should I do all this effort to learn this last little bit? Well, it's because for me, over 20 years of time, you know, it might just be like this little bit of difference every day, but over time I'm miles ahead of everybody because every day I just act like I know nothing. So I open my brain to expand, to get every piece of knowledge I can in to learn something new. And then that compounds over time to where I'm miles ahead of anybody else in my field. And, and then it's that passion for learning that's going to give you that, that edge of knowledge because the People are going to seek you out once you become a specialist instead of a generalist. That's like if you're like everybody else. But if you're a specialist where, you know, you're there's someone on here, you know, you're going to do lake properties. You want to know everything there is about the lake, you know, how the how the how the wind blows, you know, if there's mosquito problems, if there's a cistern that outflows to other lakes so that when it rains, it's not going to flood your yard. That's right on the lake. You know, all those different micro details that show your experience and level of knowledge. People are going to be pressed by that and they're going to refer you without spending a lot of marketing dollars and you're, and you're going to grow your business um, over time. The other thing I've seen that's crazy is that people don't ask for any other business. Like when they close uh, on the residential side, like what I do on my side, I try to get a um, video testimonial for them to do that where they can just click a button on my website and then my guy can just edit it for them or crop mm -hmm. it or whatever. If they don't want to do that, then I ask for a picture with a testimony. And then sometimes they don't know what to say. They're frozen, right? They're like, they're not good at writing testimonials. And so I'll give them some ideas or suggestions, you know, and say, is this okay to, you know, have this here? And they're like, sure. Sometimes they don't want a picture of themselves. They just want a name and a testimonial. Other times they don't want any of that, but they'd be happy to talk to someone over the phone if you'd like a, a, a reference or something mm. like that. So I don't do it as a yes or no. I go from... The one that I want is the strongest all the way down so that I get something like 90% of the time out of that. And then I also ask them for um, the referral and, you know, all these different things. I have a whole system that I ask for each time with each client. Um, and then that just builds like you'll see on my site, I've got dozens of testimonials. I've got video testimonials. I've got dozens of other people that you know, or private weapons defense contractors that don't want to be on camera that will talk to people on the phone and give me a good, a good review or whatever. Um, as you become more established, most of my clients don't even ask for that. They can see that I've got 
15,000 posts on bigger pockets. I've been doing it 20 years. I'm an investor also. I know what I'm doing. They can tell by talking to me on the phone within a span of 10 minutes that I'm very knowledgeable with the space. You mm -hmm. know, so, mm -hmm. you know, when you're first starting out, you just got a couple of testimonials and stuff then people are going to want to check those, you know, when you're earlier on in your career. And yeah. I just want to give people the reality of any trader profession. When you're in your twenties and thirties, you typically look for a magic pill, right? You know, you look for all this magic pill crap and you bounce from industry to industry. And you're like, what? I, you know, someone's doing some smoke and mirror thing on YouTube and they got 3 million followers. Well, They've been doing it for 12 years and they have three guys working for them full time in a room. And then they work 12 hours a day editing all this crap, right? So they don't sit on their ass like they make it appear in the video. It's all smoke and mirrors and illusions, right? Yeah. And so any field to be at the top of that field, you're going to have to work. You're going to have to put in the work to be the best. There's, there's no way around it. You have to accept it in your mind as the way it's going to be every day. People are afraid of change. And if you're not changing, you're dying. Basically, our whole life, we evolve every single day into a better version of ourselves. So you have to, instead of living under a rock, you have to embrace that change and say, this is going to be good for me. It's going to be beneficial for me. It might be uncomfortable in the moment, but in the end, it's going to make me a stronger person in business, life, personal life, everything. Um, and just the stats, you know, you were talking about the stats. The stats are about... Um, you know, in the first year, all the agents that are newly licensed, about 90% of them won't last a year. That's mm -hmm. just the reality of it. I'm, I'm talking the ones that just do a couple of sales. Um, then out of the remaining five years, 80% of those that were remaining will be gone, yeah. be out of the business. Um, and so there's an arc. In the beginning, you have no referral business, and you're having to do all this, like, um, you know, going out, getting the business, prospecting, all that. And then kind of like five or six years in, it's about half and half. And then when you get about, you know, 10, 15 years in, you have very little prospecting because you have so many existing clients that buy again and again or just refer you mm. to, to other people. But, you know, generally the, the realtors, I mean, every economic cycle, about a million of them are so flush out. The business. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it's just they're, they're looking for this magic bill, you know, yeah. and it's in. I remember one thing my broker told me in a license class when I first got licensed about 20 years ago, she said, don't worry about the money, take care of the people. And eventually the money will come and take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And it's hard when you're starting out because you know, pot to piss in and you're desperate for the first sale, but people can read that desperation. Right. So mm -hmm. what you can do is if you don't have the knowledge, show the, show the character. On a, on a personal level, like especially in the residential side, commercial is a little bit different. It's a lot of numbers analysis, but there's still a relationship there. But the residential, show them you're there for them. You're almost like a psychologist listening to their current concerns about the money being spent um, and, and just walk them through that process. Because um, usually when people are first licensed, they'll have a family or friend that'll use them a couple of times. And then they don't know what to do after that because you're running your own company. It's not like you're working at some place, just collecting a check, doing one out of a hundred items that's required to run that business. You're, you're the business. Now you have to bring in the business to you to survive and thrive. Yeah. Um, so it's stuff business, just like anything else. But if you make it through and you persevere, the rewards are amazing. Yeah. I love that, man. A couple things to unpack there. Um, one was the uh, was the testimonials talking about uh, just capitalizing on that. And there's so many people that do not capitalize on grabbing testimonials, and then and then you talk about the education, like becoming a specialist. Um, I love that, like like the, the just using the analogy or the example of of at a lake. And I think so many real estate agents, and it's this isn't just young agents or or lack of experience agents. It's it's just it's agents in general, and there's just not enough education. Like you are a beaming example of somebody who clearly has taken this to a different level. Uh, and and as, it, as it relates to just taking what Joel is describing and going and becoming that specialist and, and becoming uh, just continually learning and growing, uh, man, it's so underrated, Joel. It's so underrated. And 
And I don't want to continue down that path because you already gave uh, nuggets that I didn't even expect today. So uh, I'm appreciative of that. I want to get into your specialty, which is the triple net side. And, you know, when I first saw the request come over to be a guest on the podcast and I glanced at it, I thought to myself, all right, what is this going to have to do with a residential real estate audience and how are they going to find value from it? And so, again, you specialize in triple net. Let's start here. You explain, because I don't want to assume everybody knows what triple net is. They should, but explain what triple net is and then maybe help articulate why this has relevance to a residential real estate professional. Okay, so <clears throat> triple net is net, net, net. So it means that uh, it's almost like a stock, except you own real estate. It's commercial landlord tenant laws, which are a lot more favorable than residential landlord tenant laws because they're constantly trying to protect the government's constantly trying to protect those tenants because they're um, considered unsophisticated, whereas on the commercial side, both parties, the landlord and the business, are considered sophisticated parties in a transaction or a lease. And so net, net, net means the property taxes, insurance, maintenance to the property is totally done by the tenant. You do nothing. You, do, you get mailbox money, but without the volatility of the stock. You have a long-term lease, typically 10, 15, 20 primary years, and then options. And most people buy the investment grade credit rated tenants that standard and poor, standard and poor's triple B minus or better rated uh, credit grade that over, you know, the last 50 years, they have a default rate of maybe like a quarter of 1% or something like that. It's like nothing, right? So there's like almost no risk to own any these assets. And so people that tend to obtain wealth, you know, if you, if your net worth is 200,000, and you're getting a 10% return a year, you can't really live off of $20,000. But if you're worth 5 million, you invest 3 million and you got 5% usable cash flow, 150,000. In most markets, you can live comfortably off that, keep growing the money, reinvest it, generation of capital, keep growing that money. Um, where it relates to residential agents is, you know, after a time in your career, you have so much success, you're going to want to. Um, tamp down a little bit, slow down, enjoy life a little bit. You're not going to be dealing with tenants, toilets, termites. Uh, you know, I know a lot of uh, landlords that stayed in residential for 40 years, had three or four heart bypass surgeries and strokes and all kinds. Of, it's a lot of, it's a lot of stress dealing with those residential tenants, right? They don't want to pay the rent. They're, but the Xbox or the large TV, you know, I used to own an apartment building, I had 20 tenants. So, I mean, I know that space. And it's just not the lifestyle I, I wanted. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to convert your um, investments that are active investments and your income from your business being a residential agent to eventually over portfolio to the passive side where you're not doing anything. So if I have half a million coming in passively a year, I can decide how much I want to work, how much I don't want to work. I can decide my, um, this is the other huge mistake that I see agents make. Um, they take any business in and try to make a sale with it out of desperation versus having a focus and a plan, right? So I have what I call my ideal client profile and they meet certain objectives. Like they're a surgeon that makes, you know, million and a half, two million bucks a year. They're a high level corporate executive. Uh, they're a medium to large business owner. I've been doing it so long that I know who's an optimal client, who is not. And I make them sign an exclusive written agreement to work with me for a year because I know how long stuff takes to, to find it. Um, and so by doing that, I have a vision. So if someone else comes to me and says, I have 20 million to invest, but I wanna look on the side or I wanna like alter your agreement or whatever, I tell them to F off, go pound sand. You know, I say, I got, a, I got an agent that's five years in the business that'll take your business. I take a referral fee off of it. I just hand them off to them. Because it's, I don't need to do that many sales, right? Mine are bigger sales. So I can, I can do 15, 20 transactions a year and make like, you know, 3 million income and just take that money and then put that into value add stuff. I'm stabilizing myself, dark buildings on the triple net side, and then syndicate the rest of my passive investors. And just between my net worth growth there and my income growth, I can scale my net worth five, 10 million a year, working like 30 hours a week. But it took me 20 years to develop that ideal game plan, right? Because when you make the first million, you're 
just going balls out, you know, trying to do anything. You're younger, put tons of hours in. Then after a while, you're like, whoa, this is, I'm making a lot of money now, but this is really hard work. How can I systematize this and structure with my ideal clients to have the business and the daily life that I want, you know, with, with having an easier life. And then that's when I developed my game plan is set up that way. So as it relates to just this whole mindset and, and shift, you know, what is, what is your advice to a real estate agent, uh, you know, as it relates to this topic? So what, you know, I would say, what kind of life do you want to live on ideally or your ideal life on a daily basis? That's the most important thing above anything. That's the most important thing. Because when people make their first hundred or two hundred thousand a year, and they were making thirty thousand a year, they get a chance to breathe and then say, "Okay, what am I passionate about in life?" You know, instead of just paying the bills that are going to be shut off next week. Then after you make your first million, you're like, "Okay, I made my first million. If I live conservatively off of seventy thousand a year off my investments, I don't have to work another day in my life. So I've met my burn rate, like what I'm spending out each month compared to what my investments generate for me in return. So then that's another level of elation." Then when you get into five and 10 million plus net worth and you start getting older in age, um, you start valuing time a lot more than money um, because you see that money is infinite, time is not, right? And so then you're talking about what kind of life do I want to live on a, a daily basis? So people talk about balance. Balance is bullshit. There's, there's no balance. So I tried that in the past. What I focus on is harmony. Like how do I feel today? Because you could have, 100 hours in four different buckets and you could be technically balanced in all aspects of your life and be absolutely miserable you could hate it you know be absolutely just destroy everything you're like harmony is about how much do i want to work how much family time do i want how much you know traveling do i want to do how much do i want to work on my health on a daily basis and it's a constant adjustment on a daily basis about how you feel in the moment what kind of life you want to live so so my goal personally um that i set because I'm 48 now, by the time I'm 70, billion net worth, um, bought a thousand properties, being a thousand podcasts. Um, that, that's the metrics that I've set for myself. Working no more than 30 hours a week. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've employee systems, processes, and I'm okay with um, by the time I'm 70, if I'm worth 500 million, if I did it my own way and lives my own way in my own life. And I have those memories, the videos and pictures to pass on that I enjoyed myself and I can pass on to future generations to inspire them. Like sometimes people ask me like, why do you want to be a billionaire? It has absolutely really nothing to do with money. I enjoy like giving the car wash person a great tip and knowing that they can take their family out that week and see their place light up. That gives me more Joy now than making another million. The million's nice, but it doesn't give me the same payoff that it used to when it was the first million. Um, and so the other part is if I came from nothing, I mean, I was on food stamps where, you know, my father was killed in a car accident when I was 15 years old. You know, we, you know, we went through hell and back, um, you know, and, and if I can do that and achieve that massive goal, then everybody else in my future bloodline, no matter how small or big they think their goal is, then I'll be a benchmark where they'll feel inspired to achieve it. And so for me, that's the, that's the goal behind making that billion dollar net worth. It's, it's nothing to do with the money whatsoever. It's just yeah. the, the hitting that, hitting that goal. And so I've just known people that start having success and then they, here's a, here's, here's another golden nugget. So in real estate, you have nights, weekends, you have maybe a spouse that doesn't understand the space. Um, you know, it can be easy to have success with it once you get success rolling with the business. It can be hard at home to work on that, your, your health or other aspects of your life with your spouse and everything. And then you pour all the stuff into your business, right? Because it's easy. You're getting traction on something. This is difficult. You stay away from that. And now you grow your business, but every other life area of your life is suffering, going in the toilet. Basically, you're str I know people, my estate planning attorney, he told me a guy that worked 80 hours a year at his business until his seventies, sold it for 200 something million dollars, called up his kids, wanted to spend time with the grandkids. They wouldn't let him around. Him. They, they said, you were never there when we were growing up. He's like, Oh, I did this business, all this for you. And they're like, we didn't give a shit about that. We wanted you to spend time with us when we were growing up as a kid. We didn't want you working 80 hours a week. Right. So money is great, but 
to have a life plan and to be happy in the moment um, and have the ideal life you want on a daily basis is, is much more important. I've talked to thousands of investors over the years on the phone in person, you know, extraordinary net worth, nine figures, um, some families that are billionaires and you listen to their knowledge and their experience about what they wish they would have done differently, you know, how they, how they could go back in time. So I just kind of always taken a knowledge of what people are telling me. Yeah, man, that's, uh, that's deep. You went a lot deeper on triple net than, uh, I anticipated there. <laughs> yeah, but I could talk about, I could talk about triple net for months. But well, I like I, I like actually, I think what you just dropped though is arguably more valuable and especially in today's day and age with social media and, you know, everybody has a voice and, and, you know, you go back to the word balance and I agree with you. Like I call it bullshit too. It's, it is bullshit because uh, to me, the people that that talk about that quote unquote balance are the same people that to me, that's their excuse. That's their excuse for why they're not achieving something else because they want to call it balance. But we're all very different. And what you and I might consider balanced is completely different than somebody else. What I do in my free time as a hobby is is things that actually feed my business rather than watching television or scrolling TikTok. I prefer to be editing videos. I enjoy it. It's my hobby. And some people might say, well, you need to take a break. Why? Like, because you need to take a break. I don't necessarily, that's not a break. This is a break to me. Right. And, and uh, I, I love that you said that harmony is the right word. I think for real estate agents, as you know, Joel, like most of them get in the business because of that flexibility and that freedom. And it's, it's a result of that flexibility and freedom, why they're not successful. And um, what would you say to that? You know, you being around the business and, and I know this has gone completely off base, but it's value and that's all that matters is what would you say to the agents that are sitting there struggling, but ultimately when they look in the mirror, there's not a whole lot of activity happening. It's like, they're just sitting and waiting for business to show up at their front door. Right. So what am I, um, one of my friends a long time ago told me um, a piece of advice that I always still hold to this day. He said, everybody in the room um, talk about, you know, what, what business are you in? Right. And then someone said, you know, HBAC, someone's in real estate, blah, 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 the pizza business, whatever. And then he said, no, you're wrong. What do you mean? No, you're wrong. No, that's my business. No, he's like, no. If you take every successful business down to its core, what is the common denominator? He says you're in the marketing business. Mm. He said every business, successful business, they have a great, great marketing. That's what they have to, to generate the business. And then they take care of the customers. He said that's the number one denominator of successful people. It's not the specific business or trade that you're in. You have to enjoy that trade, but the marketing is the, is the number one Um it's a determina determination of success. And so that's why people that just kind of sit around and wait for business to come to them, it's not going to happen. Like some people will buy a subway. Like I know people will buy a subway and a buddy of mine owns like 25 of them. And these people with these individual retirement accounts, they'll come and uh, retire. And they'll know nothing about the food business. They'll spend 350000 build out for a brand new subway with a location. And they'll just expect all these people to come in, right? Everybody has to eat, but they don't have to eat at your place. You know, there's tons of places to eat at, right? It's competitive. And so after six months, they're like, oh, holy crap. I didn't know all this stuff was required to be a success. And then he comes in and buys the building for like, you know, the, the build out for like 50 cents on the dollar, all brand new crap. And then just puts his system in place for his other 25 EOMs. And he just buys them for, you know, instead of spending all that money, he just takes, buys them out of their problem, you know, and lets them, you know, make that mistake. Um, so it's like you you have to go out there and proactively get the business. I know people that are great with every technical detail of a contract, right? They're awesome technician, but their personality is mud, right? And they don't know how to connect with people or, or create that personal relationship, right? And so they struggle to get business and close business. So if you're that type of person and you're super dry and it's going to be hard for you to connect with people, then maybe that type of person, you might be better off teaming up with someone else that has a vibrant personality 
that then makes that connection on that end, but they might not be good over here as a technician. And then you form a team and you do the technician side and they do the front end part with the relations. And then you become a success that way, whereas you couldn't have been on your own because you're just too drive personality to connect with people. You struggle too much. So a lot of it is about understanding yourself, what you can improve on. It's okay to learn about everything, but like my, like my website guy, right. That does my graphics and my book and developing my backend system and all that. He's been doing it for like 40 years, comes from England, lives here in America. I mean, we'll be doing a graphic, right? And in real time, like what would take me a month and would look like crap, he's doing in like three minutes and it looks mm -hmm. phenomenal, right? In real time, we're just doing, banging out these pages and you just learn like some people are more gifted at certain things. Stay in your lane, understand the other stuff on a, on a macro level, but stay in your lane, know what your gifts are and then really become a specialist with those, with those gifts. Um, and, and so a lot, a lot of these agents just struggle, you know, a lot of these agents, they start out and they try to go to these hundred percent, uh, $400 transaction fee places. Mm -hmm. You can go to that. And if you're an investor and you just want it to buy other properties, you know, and, and just get access to them MLS, then that's great. Self-starter. But if you don't know what the hell you're doing, that broker that's doing the $400 transaction fee. They're not going to spend all this time with you to help you learn the trade and all that. They're just, they're, they're, they're like an agent farm, an agent mill. Basically they're just getting hundreds of agents. A certain percent of them will do a close X number of transactions and they'll bring, you'll bring X number of revenue to them. They don't give a shit about you. You know, if you go and you learn where you're giving 50% away and they put that time into you, then yeah, maybe eventually after you put in two or three years of time, you go to a better 80, 20 split or something, 85, 15, but, but then you've learned the game, you know, from someone instead of reinventing the wheel and you have a much higher level chance of success that way than just looking. A lot of times people step over, you know, pennies or uh, dollars to save pennies, basically. Yeah. Like I, I have people in commercial real estate, they'll be like, well, I could put a million and a half down on something. Wouldn't it be better for me to pay a million and a half all cash and have no mortgage? Wouldn't that be safer? Well, no, it's not going to be safer because you're going to have a mom and pop tenant in some rural area in the middle of nowhere that has a high chance to blow it out and go in dark during a downturn economic time because they're not strong. Then you're not going to be able to backfill it because during that downward economic turn, no one's going to lease the damn thing. They're not going to be in those areas in the middle of nowhere on a downward turn. They expand when it's in an economic upturn. And so you're going to lose, you know, probably half a million dollars or more just to dump the damn thing and get out yeah. of it. Versus if you would have taken that million and a half, bought some at three million, gotten a strong suburban core area, high traffic counts, strong investment, great credit tenant, then you wouldn't have had any problems. Yeah. Like like during during coronavirus, all my clients that bought investment great tenants paid the rent like clockwork. No PPP loans, no problems, none of that. All that crap was with five unit franchisee tenants and, you know, mom and popper triple net crap and stuff like that, like low, no credit stuff. Right. And I don't sell my clients on that because I'm already wealthy and I don't want in three years for them to come to me and say, Hey, Joel, fix this problem. And I have time with my three-year-old son and my wife, and my 80 year old mom and my own personal time. I don't want to fix all that crap. Like I, I, I destroy like on the commercial side, I destroy listing brokers pitch in like 60 seconds, basically, you know, because all I have to do is say they're selling, you know, good, bad, marginal crap property on behalf of the seller. That's their job. Mm -hmm. And they're split on the commercial side is like a hundred thousand is going to a national commercial brokerage and, and 50,000 of that goes to the brokerage. The rest of the 50,000 is on a team. And so the senior director is getting maybe 26,000. The guy in the middle is getting 14. And then the junior agent might be getting $7,000 out of that hundred grand. That's all they're making. So they have to do 10 to 12 transactions to my one because I own the company. I get to keep it all. And so I can tell these buyers, I'm like, if you try to work with them, they're just going to sell you whatever junk's in their portfolio. If you agree to work with me exclusively, I'm wealthy. If it takes five, six months to find you the right property, I'll tell you if it's a piece of shit. You know, don't buy it. I don't want that problem. I'm already wealthy. I don't want to deal with that. And then usually when I tell them that, they're like, okay, where do I sign? Press hard. You know, I want this, you know, because they know they're not going to be sold a bunch of crap just to affect the sale, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
you really have to like the new agents on the residential side, you really have to watch out and, and have that integrity, that personal integrity when no one else is looking and you have to say, even though I know it's hard, I'm going to sell them the property I believe is the best for them versus what makes me the most money or just making a quick sale in the moment because I got to pay some bills, you mm -hmm. know, that's short-term thinking. Um, long-term success is cultivated over time, but it, it's much greater success that you have over time too. And that versus the short term, um, that's like investors too, right? So, you know, you'll work with these investors that are like, oh, I'm going to cut the broker agent's commission um, on, on this deal, right? So I can just squeeze out another $4,000 of profit on this one deal. Well, that's stupid thinking, right? You know, you, you're chopping off that broker agent at the knees on the commercial side. I pay him more money. I'm like, I'll, I'll give you a percent or 2% more than whatever you're getting from the seller or whoever else just to bring me that value add deal. I'll, I'll pay you more. Um, you know, and I require um, clients to pay me more if they want to work with me. So I have it where they sign, they pay me an extra 1% because these volume guys on the commercial side, they'll sell, they'll list like, 50 olive gardens for 200 million portfolio and they'll agree to below market rate commission because they're selling that whole portfolio then they'll spin them off individually well my client's only buying the one olive garden not the 50 i'm not getting the benefit of selling 200 million at two percent commission or whatever yeah um and so i have that i will try to have them pay me the seller and the loi regardless of the listing agreement i will have them pay me that other one percent sometimes they will sometimes they'll pay me just a half a percent but I tell the buyer, you're not, you're not going to be responsible for anything more than that 1% to me, you know, to make up the total of the 3%. Yeah. And I just take those buyers that, that come in that way um, and that use my mortgage broker. That's another thing too. Like develop, you, you're only as strong as the, your strongest link in the chain. Mm -hmm. um, and so you might have a good client, but they get with some mortgage broker that doesn't know what they're doing or they're unproven. And then they tell them they can do all this stuff and then they can't. And then the deal blows up. Right. And then even though it wasn't your fault, that client now blames you because you're the main point of contact. So, you know, like my mortgage guy, he's been in, he has own capital markets mortgage company now, but he's been in mortgage for 40 years. Like he used to work at the big banks, had hundreds of people underneath him. And then he went out and did his own thing. And so I've closed like, I don't know, so many dozens of deals with him over the years. And I just know that like whatever rate he quotes, he's super communicative. He's no BS. He does a lot of um, business uh, with these lenders. And so they're not going to screw him because they don't want to burn that bridge. Right. Like that, like that's another thing. Like people at these banks, they want stuff in a nice bow, right? Because they don't want to scream and waste a lot of time on borrowers that, that are not going to be a fit. Right. And they're just wasting a lot of time. Um, so if you can save the bank that time, I, I explain it to buyers like this. If you're worth 10 million bucks, but you're just calling a bank, Joe Schmo, and they, you know, some grunt on the phone is telling you I can do for, you know, whatever it is now, 7% interest rate. Um, and then they get to committee and they say, well, I'm sorry, Timmy told you that, but that's, that's not correct. And now you spent tens of thousands of reports and expenses. And you got to get an extension from the seller at the last second. They're all pissed off. Now you got to do more non-refundable earnest money or they tell you to go pound sand, sand, get lost. Versus that mortgage broker, they might do $140 million a year business with that bank. If there's a problem, they're not going to kick that mortgage broker to the side. They want that relationship, you know, because it's easier for them to do a billion dollars worth of loans from five or six good brokers that put everything in a nice bow than to deal with talking with, 150 people with money, but don't know what the hell they're doing, trying to yeah. do, a, do a loan for, right? And so a lot of times it's just educating the borrower on the um, the process. Um, the other thing is communication. Like I can't, I can't stand this personally. And some of these agents are like, if I don't have anything good to tell them or it's a bad piece of information, then I'm going to put it off and not tell them. Yeah. Or if I have no news, I'm just not going to tell them anything. Yeah. And then either one of those is bad. Yeah. One of them you should have told them earlier, right from the get-go, kept them informed so it didn't turn into a bigger problem that's harder to overcome. 
The other one is you're, you're building up their anxiety because you might have done 50 transactions before in your career and you know everything about that. And you know it's nothing to worry about. But they, this is going to be the first time buying something ever or in the last seven years. They don't know what's changed. They don't know anything, right? And so by you not telling them anything, their anxiety level increases up. They think you're a poor communicator. They think, you know, you don't care, yeah. um, bad business. They're not going to refer you to somebody else because you stress them out. You know, there's going to be all these things like on the, like, so what I've done, so then people, then agents will tell me like, well, I just can't do that all the time. What if I run out of time? I can't do that. Well, do what I did, right? I wrote the book. The book's got a lot of steps in there, right? I was on a lot of podcasts talking. They can digest that. I've got 15,000 posts on bigger pockets. I tell people, if you want to sign the exclusive agreement, I'll give you my exclusive time. If you just want an education without paying me, I've got a bunch of free stuff out there. You can digest and use your own time because my time's worth 3000 an hour. So if you want to, if you want to do that, great, go for it. And then even outline the process, right? So you could outline the process in a PDF, like the normal transaction day one, we do these steps day five, we do these steps day 15. We do the, and you can give them that blueprint. So when they have that anxiety, they can go back and look at that step and say, okay, this is, I can't get a hold of so-and-so on the phone. She's busy or he's busy, but I can see this is the next step I should be working on right now. And it automates a lot of the communication. Like I've actually, the guy, so I have a WordPress front end website, the triple net best.com. The back end website is being custom created triple layer encryption JavaScript where they can log in. And I'm automating, expanding on things, more things than we're in the book on the back end of the system. So I'm, building my system from the ground up. The uh, engineer for um, Lowe's Home Improvement that did their website and their apps, that's still one of their, that's still their lead engineer. Um, he's developing my system, coding it, and building it from the ground up. And then my marketing guy that does my website, my books, he's doing the graphical interfaces that'll connect with the code and the pages and the system. And so I'm just, like, I, I, I can't stand regular, like, emails like Comcast or Gmail because all the spam comes in and you got five deals going. You're having to try to pull out what's the latest update from whoever. That's a big cluster. So I'm developing an internal chat system that'll be attached just to that one deal for lawyers, attorneys, everything, where I can just click a tile at times the amount of time I've spent on it, zooms in on that deal. And then my employees at times their time they're spending on that deal. And then I can just do a uh, quick message to them within that deal and I can set different controls of what the attorneys will see and all these different metrics. And it's all just going to be like, um, it's going to have a self help tutorial too, also for the clients that can log in and we'll show them in real time or updates where they can log in 24 seven and see the updates. So we're not having to call them for that. Um, and so it's never been built on the triple net side. I'm kind of like building like an Amazon for triple net basically mm -hmm. for myself, because before you'd have all these little, what happens is these companies will develop a little CRM. I, all the, I'm sure all your agents can relate to this. So build a little CRM. It's got like 30% of what you want. And then they promise you all this crap. We're going to keep adding this stuff more of what you need and take your ideas into consideration. And then after they build up so many subscribers, they sell off in two years to some giant conglomerate that says they want to now go in a different direction and only does like 15% of what you want it to do or whatever, right? So you're telling your clients to go over here or Dropbox and do this and do that and DocuSign this and do all this crap. And I'm just building it all in the back end of my system in one place, one unique design. It's even going to have, um, I call it my vision board for the clients. So it's going to build, it's going to have a built-in calculator where they can convert um, their active income from their business or their job or their current investments, residential, multifamily houses. And they can convert that into passive investments. And it's going to lay out their current age and what, age they want to retire by or sell their business and then how much passive income 1 million 5 million they want to generate and then it'll tell them like how many properties they need to buy and what price range and they can set an action plan that i review with them over time for yeah. that on their, on their vision board um so i'm creating a lot of um things that other people don't do with the system it's a lot of work more than the book the book was a sure. lot of work because we spent like those are custom graphics in that book i mean we sat there and created all this crap and now I'm taking images in a book 
and having to make them dynamic and actually like click through and work in the back end of a website, which is even more work. <laughs> it's, 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 ex- it's exhausting a little bit. <laughs> well, it sounds like, uh, you know, based on everything you described today, it does not surprise me because it's almost like a hobby for you. Um, you enjoy this stuff. You already mentioned your website, uh, triple net, or I'm sorry. Yeah. Triple net invest.com. So in, in, in invest.com. Um, Joel, if somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way to do so? Well, I, you know, so I'll just, I, I'll be honest. Like, um, I think I've got a LinkedIn. I think I've got, uh, my bigger pockets, but literally like about every second of my day is planned pretty much between personal and business. So if you want my personal time, like we're talking now, you'd have to be a client. Like, like I have some, uh, agents in California you get tired after a while selling the houses, right? You want to retire. They have some money. Um, they actually signed the agreements with me and they bought a Walgreens and bought an O'Reilly's and stuff like that. So I, I have clients that are other brokers, you know, the residential high, they might sell high end homes or whatever. They've got a lot of cash sitting around. They don't want to do the residential thing. And then they contact me. So if you go to my website, you click start today form, you fill that out. That's your liquidity net worth. Um, because basically I don't have time to talk to people that are worth a hundred thousand. I just don't, you know, I can, you know, if, if you're buying something below $2 million, I can refer you off to one of my agent friends that I know are good. And I take a referral fee for that, but I get you with someone I know that's competent. So don't come do a good job. It's just, I know the amount of time, like $2 million property in the commercial space. is like a hundred thousand dollar house in the residential space, just mm-hmm. for people comparison purposes. Um, people are, might be a big fish in the residential pond, and they jump out into the sea and they're swimming among the megalodons now, you know, in the commercial yeah. space. They're a little tiny, little, little guppy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so it takes a lot of work. That's another thing. Like um, for someone buying a property, it might just be a transaction. But for me, it's my relationship on the line. So if I'm talking to, a, you know, a broker I've had, he's going to be pre-market, off-market, triple net stuff, first look at stuff. Because he knows I know what I'm doing. I've been doing it a long time. And they don't make much money. They have to do volume on their side, right? So they just want that handoff, right? You know, because they don't make much per transaction. So they don't want a lot of buyers asking them a crap ton of questions and following through the process, you know? And so they just want to hand it off to me. Well, if they get egg on their face and that deal fails, that developer will say, I won't give you business for six months. I'll go to the, to the next mm-hmm. brokerage and, and they'll lose a crap ton of money. And so the relationships are super important. So if you go to that start today form, fill it out, submit it, I'll get your information. And, and then I'll eventually have an initial intro call with you to see where you are now and where you want to go. And we'll decide if we're fit for each other. I'll send you the buyer agreement. And then you sign that agreement. And then we get started. I get my assistant to get start doing the search. We start setting up a timeline plan of action for you doing a 1031 exchange or not. All these different uh, variables come into play uh, with that. If you're just wanting, you know, knowledge, Go to Bigger Pockets. Got fifteen thousand posts on there. There's a ton of knowledge I've put over decades of time in there. I've got two podcasts over there. I've got I don't know fifteen other podcasts I've done over other places. Uh, Old Dogs Network, I think, or show. There, there's a bunch of them I've been on. Um, and then I've got my book. If you sign up for free, you see my personal book and business book on my website. Um, that, that's just kind of how you can connect. But if you want my individual time, that's all I have time for now is for exclusives. Love it, man. It's where, it's where everybody wants to get to. Go check it out at, uh, like I said, nnninvest.com. You can learn a hell of a lot more. There's a ton of assets on there. And like you said, if you're in the game of potentially investing, well, you know what to do. Click start today. Otherwise, uh, there's a ton of information on here. Joel, uh, it has been a pleasure, man. It's been a great conversation. It's, uh, like I said, not exactly where I expected it to go, but I would argue it uh, went in a great direction and it's uh, been very valuable for our listeners. So thank you. Sure. Yep. Glad to be here. Lab Coat Agents Podcast.